Well, it was the week before Christmas, and uh, here we are, anticipating what this week will bring. Um, and as we do that, let's uh, pray together. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you this morning as we come in this week before Christmas. Lord, that you can still our hearts in this busy season. Lord, that we might listen to your spirit, to what it is that you have to say to us today. Lord, we pray that you will change us, that you will transform us. Lord, that we might be like you. Lord, as we reflect on uh, this season that we're in at the moment, this wonderful season, this season of good news. We just pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. So Christmas is this season of anticipation, isn't it? We look forward to many things at Christmas. Uh, for children, of course, uh, that's Christmas Day itself when uh, they wake up early and go to the tree and see what presents are underneath the tree. For others, it may be the coming together of family that you're looking forward to this Christmas, getting together with the people that you know and love. For others, it's the activities that you do. It might be the food or the drink or that backyard cricket that you might play or swimming in the pool. But we all have this picture in our minds, don't we, or, or this anticipation of what Christmas will be like. And in fact, that's the way, generally, we tend to approach life. It's a bit like that. Christmas can be a bit of a snapshot. We've got this picture of what we believe, our desires, uh, what we should be, what our life should be like. And we nurture these certain expectations, if you like. The things that we believe will bring us happiness, that will bring us fulfillment, that will bring us contentment. But I think as we all know, our lives rarely follow those predictable patterns or those expectations that we might have. Life is rarely ever stable for us for any length of time. So I want you to think back over this last year, this period, this season that we've been in over this last year. Think about something that has happened to you that has impacted you in a significant way that you didn't expect to happen in this last year. So what comes to mind? Something that's happened in your life this year that's impacted you in a significant way that you didn't expect to happen. Now, I know enough about uh, a range of people in the room here this morning to know there's actually been quite a number of unexpected things that have happened in people's lives. There's been unexpected job loss. There's actually been unexpected new jobs for some people. Some have experienced unexpected health concerns and unanticipated journeys that go along with that. Others have needed unexpectedly to find new places to live. They didn't expect to be moving house, but they have. Some have experienced unpleasant and pleasant joys as well. So it's not just all about the unpleasant things, but there's been joyful surprises for many of you as this year has progressed. The thing is, the way that we live our lives now is that we want life to be certain. <laughs> we want that certainty in our lives. And in fact, we've lived at a time in history where we have never had more control over our lives than we do now. We've enjoyed a level of peace and prosperity in my lifetime that no generation before us has ever enjoyed. In my 50 years, I've not experienced anything like the uncertainty, the unpredictability that people have in generations before me. Now, some may call that a blessing, but it's actually done something to us as a society and as individuals as well. We've become accustomed to a particular standard of living, to a particular expectation of what life is going to be like. We've adopted a belief that life needs to play out for us in these particular favourable ways. It's also most likely dislocated us from God, from our dependence on him and our trust in him. The irony, of course, in the situation in our lives now, or the paradox, if you like, is that we expect our lives to play out this way with our obsession, if you like, for control, or in having answers or solutions to every problem that crosses our path, but yet we're the most anxious, we're the most fearful, 
we're the most aggrieved and probably the most angry society or unsettled mob that's ever been. Do you ever think about that, the irony of those two things? The fact that in many ways, it's been the most settled generation or, or life for many of us, but yet there's this heightened anxiety, there's this fear, there's this sort of sense of needing to be in control all the time. And when life turns in these sort of unpredictable ways, we pull out our kit bag of responses. We can try and fight back. We can push against those injustices that we believe that we're experiencing. Or we can look for the quick fix, you know, that solution that must be there somewhere. Or we may even deny that this is even happening to us. So we try and create this illusion that somehow we're in control when, we're, when really we're not. And sadly for some, when they get to that point, they look for an escape route, and that's really tragic. A former Prime Minister uh, of Australia in the 1970s is remembered for making this statement, life wasn't meant to be easy. I reckon if, there was a prime, if our Prime Minister today made that same statement, that life wasn't meant to be easy, I reckon he'd be held down. <laughs> Maybe easy is not the right word to say it, but I think for most people there's an expectation that we're going to be looked after. You know, that someone, whether it's the government, whether it's whoever else, they're there to ensure that we have the kind of life that we expect to have. Now, that's not the most positive picture that I bring to you on this eve of Christmas. I mean, isn't Christmas a time when we should be experiencing joy and happiness and peace and goodwill to all men and all that stuff? Well, I want to suggest that we can benefit a lot if we peel back that veneer of this glossy Christmas which we see, and if we immerse ourselves in the real story of God, that he can show us from that first Christmas what happened in that first Christmas time. As we look at the first Christmas time, what we see and understand is that we should expect the unexpected. That's what we see in the Christmas story. We see the unexpected. And the reality is that we don't know what's just around the corner as they didn't know what was just around the corner. But we can trust in God who does and who is more concerned that we have a relationship with him as saviour and as Lord rather than whether we follow the script that we write for ourselves in our lives. But please hear me though in this. I don't want for a minute to suggest that we should all just toughen up <laughs> that uh, there's some sort of response like that, that the suffering that many of you ex have experienced and will experience is inconsequential in some way to God and not truly traumatic for you. But as we enter into this Christmas story, we can see that God is there and he is with us. He's with us in the unexpected times and in the unwelcomed experiences that we go through in the same way that he was with those people who we're going to meet now in the story of the first Christmas. So we're going to go through and trek through the Christmas story in the first couple of chapters of Luke. I'm not actually going to read the text to you, I'm just going to retell this story as we go along. But if you want to follow this in your Bibles, you're welcome to. We're in Luke chapter 1. So the first people who we meet in Luke's account are a couple named Zachariah and Elizabeth and they experience an unexpected and difficult journey. For them, their story is one of infertility. They were, they were a couple from whom God's blessing should never have been too far away. Zachariah was a priest. He's like a, a, an old time pastor, if you like, back in the time. His wife, Elizabeth, was actually a descendant in the line of Aaron, Moses' brother. The couple had a very rich heritage, a very right, a right heritage, and their service for God, as Luke tells us, was impeccable. They lived blamelessly and righteously before God, Luke tells us. So if any couple was deserving of God's blessing, of God's favour, it was Zachariah and Elizabeth. But yet, as Luke tells us, they had no children. Elizabeth was not able to conceive. Some of you with us this morning know the pain of that. Some of you understand 
Elizabeth's story. For you, that was your journey, or it may even be your journey right now that you're struggling with this. For Zachariah and Elizabeth in their time, there was strong cultural shame for women who could not conceive. In Elizabeth's own words that we read in Luke's Gospel, she said that she was living in a state of disgrace. They would have been praying and petitioning God to change the situation, and it would seem like they'd reached an age where it was beyond them to be able to conceive. They waited and they waited. They prayed and they prayed until all hope was exhausted. Why had God not blessed them with children? Why, God, am I in the situation that I'm in right now? Don't I deserve your favour, Lord? I've done everything that I could do to honour you. Why are you not favouring me? This was Elizabeth's story and Zachariah's story. Perhaps it's your story too this morning. And then Zechariah, as an aged man, receives a visit from an angel while he's in the inner sanctuary of the temple. And this angel tells him that Elizabeth will become pregnant and they will have a son and that God has a special mission for this son who will prepare the way for the Messiah, the Saviour. No wonder Luke tells us that Zechariah was terrified when this angel visited. I think we all would be, wouldn't we? in that situation. He's hearing something unbelievable. For him, he's hearing something inconceivable, if I can say it that way. This angel of the Lord is coming and delivering a message which he just could not believe. And the angel's first words to Zechariah were what? Do you remember? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Zachariah was totally blindsided. He would never have anticipated being visited by this angel who was telling him that their long-held desire, that this desperation that they had to have children was going to happen. Seemingly, they were past the age of conception. Not only that, their son, their very son, was to be the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah who would lead this mission, if you like, of ushering in this new kingdom of God. This was their son, this son that they had lost hope would even come. Yet it was true, and it came to pass. But in that process, Zechariah, in his, he was dumbfounded, and he became dumbstruck. The angel said, because you did not believe, you won't speak until Elizabeth conceives this, um, births this child. But yet, as remarkable as that story is, that's mild compared to what happens next in the story. Gabriel, the angel's messenger's duties weren't finished with Zachariah. Luke tells us that as Elizabeth got closer in time to giving birth to her son, Gabriel then visits Elizabeth's cousin, a young, innocent peasant girl named Mary. Now, Mary had recently become engaged to Joseph. And after greeting Mary, the angel utters these familiar words to us. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive a son, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David. We know the story so well that in our familiarity, we can sometimes not take in the impossibility of what's going on here. (laughs) You know, what's happening to this young peasant girl, Mary. I think we can be reasonably confident that Joseph and Mary would have had a picture of what their life was going to be like. Joseph the carpenter was going to exercise his trade in this quiet town called Nazareth. They were going to live a very, um, if you like, ordinary life where he would provide for her and their family. But instead, here we are in Christmas 2022 talking about this young peasant girl, Mary. We're talking about what happened to her. There could be nothing more unexpected, nothing more unpredictable, more impossible 
than what was happening here for young Mary. Her life, as she has anticipated it, was completely turned upside down. Completely turned upside down. There was now a totally unexpected journey that she was about to embark on. And equally unexpected, probably for people like us, is the response that Mary gave to the angel. Unlike the disbelief of Zachariah, who couldn't really accept what the angel was telling him, Mary's response is quite different. She says, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And as Marty shared last week with us, we then read in Luke's gospel this song of praise that Mary gives. Her joy at what was happening, but yet her joy was not based on the changing of her circumstances. Her circumstances didn't actually, around her physically, or even economically, change at all. Jesus, as we knew, grew up in very ordinary circumstances, very humble. We know that his father, Joseph, actually died sometime after Jesus was a teenager and before uh, he came to exercise his mission in the world. In fact, this widow, Mary, was probably a single mum for some period of time as the other children in her family became of age. So this Mary, this blessed Mary, as we know her today, for her, her life was not comfortable. Her life was not predictable in any way either. But yet, there's even a more unimaginable story to come as we read through the Gospel of Luke. And it's the centerpiece of what sits at Christmas, this Christmas story. Isn't that the most unexpected and remarkable journey? That the Prince of Heaven, the Son of God, would leave the throne of Heaven and come to us, born in the most humble of families, a barn in Bethlehem, with his first visitors being smelly shepherds who had been visited by this host of angels while they were out in their fields tending to their sheep. And these angels, these heavenly hosts, Luke tells us, they break out in probably what can be only described as the most um, remarkable and probably never repeated choral performance, singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those who favour. They're not singing this at the Jerusalem Art Centre where people have paid big money to go and see. They're singing this out in the bush to three shepherds. The host of heavens are doing this. And our expectation is that life should be done in a particular way that's favourable to us. Well, Christmas tells us that God's ways are not our ways. If there's one thing for us to, to focus on, it's that God's ways are not our ways. The journeys that we read in this Christmas story, the journeys of Zachariah and Elizabeth, the journeys of Moses, of Mary and Joseph, of the shepherds, the magi, those wise men from the east who followed the stars, they were all unexpected journeys. None of them anticipated or expected or would have wanted necessarily the lives that they had led. But for each of them, their lives are changed forever by what they experienced at that Christmas time. Not because God brought them prosperity, not because God brought them good health or comfort or something that they would have desired for themselves, but because they experienced a life encountering experience of Jesus, a life, experience, a life changing encounter with God. And the thing is, it wasn't actually about them. None of it was. For Zachariah and Elizabeth, it was about their son. John, for Mary and Joseph, of course, Jesus. And for the others, you know, they were leaving what they would experience in their normal lives to come and celebrate this birth of Jesus. And while it was unexpected for us that God would send his son, not as a mighty and powerful warrior, as we saw in the video, or a great political leader, but as a common child of common parents, we learn again that God's ways are not our ways. It's not the way we approach things. No one other than Jesus' close family even knew what his mission would be when he turned 
30 years of age. And Jesus at 30 lived only for another three years. And then as we know, his life was ended when he was hanging there on the cross, seemingly defeated by this world that he had come to save. But then something unexpected happened, didn't it? Something unexpected happened. A man named Joseph took down Jesus' body from the cross and he took it to his tomb and he buried Jesus in that tomb. And then three days later, a woman named Mary came with her friend Salome and they took spices to that tomb to prepare that body. But when they got there, something unexpected happened. There was no body in that tomb. Mary ran back to tell the disciples she comes back to that tomb where she's met by an angel. As she's weeping at that tomb, she looks in to that tomb and there's two angels and they say to her, what do you think? Do not be afraid. They say to her, do not be afraid. The one you were looking for is not here. He is risen. Now, unless your name is Mary, and I have one of those, it's unlikely that you're going to be visited by an angel to tell you some, something remarkable that is going to, be, that's going to happen to you. But we have been and we will be visited by unexpected circumstances in our lives, things that we don't anticipate, things that we don't plan for, these unwelcomed, if you like, twists and turns that come our way. And you know God's spoken word for us at this time is those words that the angel delivered to Zachariah, to Mary at her birth, to Mary at the tomb. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It's not what you expected. It's not what you planned for. But I am with you, Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. And when these circumstances come to us, we actually have a choice. We can't control what happens to us. We can't control those circumstances. But we do have the capacity to influence ourselves. We do have that choice about what we are going to do at those points in time. We can choose to exercise faith and we can live in the power of the Holy Spirit at those times. This is the time when God is giving us to exercise what's called a process of, of trust change. We need to transfer the trust from ourselves and trusting in the way we believe things should play out to trusting in God. And Mary is our model at this time. Her simple yet faith-filled response to that angel those words, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. We're going to pray now. And as we pray, I want you to take a moment to take those words of Mary and to reframe them in the way that that you would like to for you and in your circumstances. Phrase those in a way as a response to God now. In the same way that Mary was able to respond, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. So offer yourself to God now and place yourself in God's hands. As we look at the end of this year to turn the calendar over to 2023, we don't know what 2023 is going to bring us, but we do know who we can trust in through 2023. So let's pray together. Lord, as we come now, we just want to offer ourselves to you. Lord, we place ourselves in your hands. And as we do, Lord, our response to you now flows from our hearts. Lord, we don't, 
necessarily welcome everything that comes our way. Lord, as, as those people in the first Christmas story, Lord, didn't even necessarily either. But we just want to thank you, Lord, that above all that we understand or above all that we try to fathom as to how our lives work through, we know, Lord, that your ways are not our ways. Lord, your ways are better than our ways. Lord, the things in our lives, the circumstances that we go through, Lord, just really in many ways surround us. But what is at the centre of us, Lord, is our relationship with you. Lord, we thank you that at Christmas time we remember Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, that you came, that you break through into the world as Saviour and Lord for all of humanity. But today for us in particular, Lord, we just want to thank you for us and for each of us. Lord, we give you praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you in your name. Amen.